I, I just want to do a little bit of talking about what, something about having said. Let's say this is your entire population. Okay, you're going to, in addition to this, you are going to break it down in positives and negatives. Okay, and so the positives, a certain part of you, them are going to be two positives, other part of them are going to be false positives. But if you have negatives, a, part, a large part of them are going to be true negatives, and some of them will be false negatives. And that's why I was asking that question about the cost, which I think I have explained very well, is You can always change your criterion of classification. For example, you're using a suspicion function, and you say point A is a positive, and above, below point A is a negative. Now, you can decide to be much stricter and say it has to be point 0.9. So you go here. What is the effect of be, being much stricter? A little bit louder. You get more voice positive. There are, if you become stricter, there are much more, much less. What? True it's collecting, is tighter. So you have, maybe you don't lose so many true positives. What you will lose, what you will be creating is a lot of false negatives. Correct? Because you're moving in that way. So what people is always bothered in research about false positives. And so they well, let's reduce false positives. What people forget is the moment you reduce your false positive, you are creating a series of false negatives because you became stricter. And vice versa, if you relax your criterion, you are creating more positives in general, but some of those positives might be false positives. So it's very common that you talk with people in industry and they keep pushing about, oh, there are many, too, too many positives, okay? But you know, when you type in your criteria, what you actually are doing is giving up some positives because your criteria become very tight. Very you are losing a lot of false positives, but you're also losing some true false positives. Same kind of thing if you move it, move it over. And then that's need to be taught. And then this core, this criteria, this discussion of the cost of a false positive or cost of the false negative become much more important because uh, if you make a cost very high of a false positive, what you are doing is tightening your criteria. If you make the cost very loose, it's indifferent if it's false positive or false negative. So this is, people don't understand these two things are correlated, they are complementary. Now there is this whole branch of statistics that Professor Schaefer developed, uh, belief networks. And Professor Schaefer's work, there is not true or false. There is true, false, and I don't know. And that's very different. And very different. That's not widely used, but you are going to hear, most of you are in the AIS survey class, and you are going to hear uh, Professor Schaefer explaining what he has been working on. And it will be very, very interesting, I think. Uh, Abby, you took his course, didn't you? What did you think? Um, yeah, you can learn a lot from him. He has this uh, com um, a new kind of machine learning theory where when you make a prediction, you can add a confidence interval, which I think is very useful. However, it's it's more like a theoretical thing. It's hard to uh, apply it to research. Yeah, and, and, and they, they NASA have used some of his 
uh, belief networks, etc. It's worthwhile for you to kind of understand what it is. And I think maybe one of these days I'll ask Professor Schaefer to do a workshop in our seminar series and talk about the basics of uh, uh, belief functions. And if he doesn't want to do that, I'll ask Rajfi Vastana to do it. So uh, I'm sure he'll do it. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting to think about that. And the other thing to call your attention again is that this idea of the cost that you include here is a very important idea because it, it will balance dramatically uh, these balances of your sample and will make you, your problem more realistic. But in general, attributing a cost is very difficult, correct? It's, uh, it's very arbitrary. But, and if you know the process, then you can think, think about CPA firms. See, what is the cost for a CPA firm if they make a mistake and they give a clean opinion to a company that has material error? Can go out of business. Can hear you. It, it, it can become ongoing concern. You know, remember Arthur Anderson? You know, they were uh, determined that they made a huge mistake and that the company which existed for 110 years suddenly disappeared. So, Companies get sued when company, when their clients go bankrupt. That's the reason that they get mostly sued. They also get sued when they, uh, when they, the situation that you described, uh, they get sued when they, uh, when they leave an audit and they would say we left the disagreement to the client. So auditors don't like, they always say we, we resigned uh, in good faith or whatever. They don't like to say we are forced out one or the other because they could be sued. But main form of litigation comes from the fault. And the reason why they come, it comes from the fault is because when a company defaulted, they don't have money left. And so, who can be sued? The company can be sued, you can't extract any. So you sue the auditors. Mm -hmm. And so that's something for you to always have in mind. But, so the company, the CPA firm, doesn't have a lot of cost in giving a false true opinion, unless, unless the company defaults. And my opinion, and this, there is no proof of this, my opinion that uh, there are a lot of false negatives in audits. And when Abby was working on restatements, what Abby is picking up is the utmost cases of audit error. But there is a, and I say the say, same thing about bankruptcy. There are many companies that went bankrupt, chapter 11, chapter 7. But there are many companies that did go bankrupt, but they are in the non-bankrupt category because they got bought off by someone, they got, uh, uh, they renegotiated loans, and they did all kinds of things like that. So that's actually always my difficulty with these prediction studies dealing with restatements. Abby, what do you think? Uh, I think that uh, currently it's just that for researchers there's no good source for them to... It's like when you want to study something but you need to study it with a glass. Like you cannot touch it physically. So that's why there are so many proxies which are... Uh, like you, you wouldn't believe that you can use that proxy to measure the phenomenon of study but that's really due to the limitation of the data access. So the lack of observability. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and also when you talk about uh, audit quality, I think all of you read the Define and John 2014 paper. They actually define audit quality as, okay, you first, uh, first of all, you need to make sure that the financial statement reasonably represents the uh, underlying economy of the, of the client, but also you need to add value to the client, right? But how can you measure that? So that's really the issue. Uh, uh, but the restatement, um, 
like uh, like according to the argument of the literature, they say okay uh, because okay auditors reasonably assure, but in the end people found out that this this financial statement actually is materially misleading. Then that's the auditor's fault because you fail to capture these material mistakes. So restatement is just one aspect of fraud equality. So this is one issue. The second issue is for the PCOB, they think good audit quality is that auditor follow the steps properly um, instead of um, like material statement. But for that aspect, there is no good proxies for us to use. So that's why you will see a lot of the research that has good uh, framework, but people don't have good data to value. Uh, however, you can still you know, argue that, okay, I, I believe this, but that's the issue shared by this community, as I said. Yeah, meaning I have this, this kind of problem with bankruptcy studies and with audit studies. And I, the other thing that I always say, and I know this is a little bit erratic here, is I always say that uh, financial statements today are not very good prediction of market value and market issues, a very limited uh, relationship. The R squares these days are, uh, the adjusted R squares are in the uh, four to six percent. Okay, now auditing them has limited value because these things are not very useful. Uh, and one of the ways that uh, the PCOB acts is basically finding out if the auditor followed, yes, generally accepted auditing standards. But these rules are very old fashioned. Okay, so they are not really looking at audit quality, they are looking at following bad rules. Or at least not very adequate rules. Maybe that's a overstatement here. And so, you know, uh, this is a comment I have been around for a long time. And uh, when Sabay's Oxley came in, there were several audit failures, etc. And so, the Congress decided to create the PCOB. So remember what I said last time, there is the PCOB, and there is the ASB. And the ASB, the Auditing Standards Board of the AICPA, used to set all the auditing rules of the United States, and then Enron, WorldCom, happened, and several others. And so, SOX was created, Sabay's Oxley. And what did Sabay Oxley say? First thing that Sabay said is that the auditor needs to issue an opinion on controls. And that's what Abby was talking about, integrated audit, correct? I was understanding correctly, which there was an opinion on financial statement and an opinion on controls. Typically, they are in the same opinion statement. Okay, but it also said the AICP is not good to supervise audits. We need to create an organization that supervises audits and sets auditing standards. Not like the FASB, because the FASB creates the rules of accounting, but the SEC enforces the rules. The PCOB creates the rules and enforces the rules at the same time. So it's different. Also, who pays for the PCOB? Is a tax on the accounting firms. And that money is given to the SEC, who the PCOB reports to the SEC, but the money is totally dedicated for PCOB activities. And the PCOB has board members that set up standards, 
some staff, and they have inspectors who go and investigate if auditing are good. In the, what is it, the 20th of February, we are going to be teaching for the inspectors. We'll be teaching, correct? Um, and what we are trying to do is train them in analytics and et cetera, et cetera. But they have like 600 inspectors. Big budget. Okay. These guys here don't have inspectors. What they have is peer reviews. So one firm inspects the other. And this was very criticized, and that's why PCOB created this whole inspection program, which is something that you need to think a little bit. So what I usually say, in my opinion, is just opinion, I don't have proof of this, is that there is no, I think there is enough proof to say that the creation of the PCOB undoubtedly improved obedience to the rules. But the rules are not very good. And that's, of course, that's just an opinion. Yes? Majority of, I mean, I, I'm just interested in your opinion. Because majority of investors rely on financial statement as kind of like an auditor basically verifying to trust the company which issues tax and bonds. So you're saying that financial statement is flaky kind of like the way so poor. I don't know the word flaky applies. What I said is financial. But when Bauer Brown, when Bauer Brown created the basic equation whereby market value is a function of financial variables, right. at that time the R, adjusted R square was between 40 and 60 percent. And now we are down to something like 4 to 6 percent. You, you missed the last class, but the last class we were talking about. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, basically this particular phenomenon and uh, about the Baruch Lab's end of accounting book, which basically talks about that. And what, just to give you the summary of what Baruch Lab says, he says in the first four or five chapters, he shows basically this phenomenon. The number he comes up with is like 5%. And then the end of his book, he says that other variables, non-gap variables as we call them, would increase substantially the explanatory value of financial statements. And those non-gap variables are oil reserves in the oil industry, patent stream on the drug industry, et cetera, et cetera. And he had several PhD students of his doing dissertation showing this. Then what else we said last class was that the world has changed and a lot of assets are not physical assets anymore. The, in the old days, you know what assets were, we talked about Pacioli here, was inventory to sell, physical goods. So you counted physical goods, property that you had, and loans between, uh, between borrowers or between partners and etc. Et so those were the assets. Today, most Many firms, like the most valuable firms in the world, are all virtual assets. Meaning they are not assets. What is, how can you value the patent on office, or etc. And uh, the other thing is the moment you sell a copy of office, you are not depleting your inventory. So it turned in that every day, these measurements that we have here, are being preempted by the change in business habits and technology. And more and more, meaning what are the most valuable companies in the world these days? Google, Amazon. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, uh, Apple. Alibaba. Alibaba, okay. And what are the assets these companies have? Now, Microsoft used to have, uh, what, $50 billion in cash? They were so rich. They sell a lot of cash. Okay, and so that's easy to measure how much cash they have in the bank. But what is the value of the supply chain of Amazon? Well, you can do cost basis, how much costs them to build a supply chain. But that's not a particular good measure. 
So this is actually the problem, uh, the problem that we have with measurement of the value of financial reporting and the value of auditing. Now, there are a whole set of initiatives trying to improve this. When this happened, the annual and World Cup, the AICPA created this, called, this thing called Enhanced Business Report. It was the AICPA committee before the AICPA lost standard setting for public companies and uh, created five models of new models of measurement. Uh, Michael Alice and myself did what we call the Galileo model. And then there were the firms that made some models that were much more conservative. I'm going to, I never even thought about bringing the Galileo model. Here now bring it. We published it on the web. We didn't publish a book on it. Um, and but it's still over there. Uh, but since then, what happened is the AICPA finished this and moved. There are these initiatives, SASB, and there is the Integrated Reporting Initiative, and there are some couple of other initiatives or expanded reporting initiatives. Uh, you guys know Selena, who do a pay, and we did a paper which we, uh, which we basically talk about uh, real-time XPRL. And if you don't know what XPRL here is, XPRL is a way to represent your financial statements on electronic form with the standard chart of accounts. But because the charts of accounts in the US are not standardized, uh, you do a thing called a taxonomy, which is a very long list of accounts and you say, my account is this one, is this one, and this one, and therefore you can compare Microsoft with some other company, Oracle or whatever. And so that's what XPRL. The next time I'm going to teach you a little bit more about XPRL for you to see, but I, I don't need to do that because you will see this. Uh, Professor No will talk about that in, uh, in your survey. Okay. But, XPRL basically taxonomized, so you have this standard, uh, this chart of account with about 15,000 accounts. And however, the companies can use it, what the thing called extension taxonomy. And what is an extension taxonomy? When you don't find the account name that you're using, you put it as an extension. And of course, they have a lot of accusations that companies don't want to be compared, so they change the name of their accounts. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that's like thinking that the tail is moving the dog. Okay, it's uh, companies don't think that way, and, and XPR is not that important. But about 60 countries adopted XPR in Brazil, and is doing some things like Siconfi and Spaggy are all XPR derivatives. Uh, so, many countries are adopting, and what was the purpose of XPRL? The purpose of XPRL was to allow the supply chain to use the same information without republishing the data, without re-preparing the data. And so, there is a thing called XML, Extensible Markup Language, and extensible markup language have many derivatives in many industries. One of them is the financial industry, XPRL. And more and more, more and more utilization is being invented in XPRL. We started the committee on XPRL, I think it was 2003. Uh, so I've been around 15 years, maybe more than that. Uh, I think it went very short, should have done much more on uh, creating electronic reports, but SEC requires it, and now they have created this version of XPRL that integrates the documents, the electronic document and the PDF of the financial report. And so that's the kind of integrated XPRL that exists. But back to, back to this discussion, these are all kind of logistic developments uh, the essence of financial reporting continues being the same. And every day, 
financial reporting goes farther from representing sustainability, supply chain, intellectual property, all these additional variables that today explain largely the value of companies. I mean, tell me, can you value Netflix by looking at their physical assets? Can you value uh, Apple, you can argue a little bit that you can value some of Apple because Apple sends a lot of physical things and they have a cost of goods sold and the cost of goods sold has a big effect on on the earnings. Even with Netflix, we might say, even with Netflix, for example, you can say, uh, here I have 50 million members, each member pays so much subscription costs. You're so just inventing accounting rules, which I think they should do. That's not what, what is the base of uh, financial statements. That's only the one part of this thing, is the, is the repeatable, repeatable revenue that they have. And that's why when Netflix, just yesterday or two days ago, declared that the growth of the U.S. basis has flattened, the stock took a big beating until they announced that the international growth has gone up. And so they are totally ignoring the cost basis and the supply chain and uh, the other thing for these companies like Netflix and Disney, etc. the cost of the product, in the contracts that they have with uh, uh, producers of content is very, very important. And those things are very difficult uh, to measure under these rules because those things are very much like promises of payments of the future, contingent on this, contingent on that. Uh, I happen to see some of these contracts because of my daughter, and uh, they are really very intricate. And they are not captured very well with the rules. Now he is defending the financial accounting standards. <laughs> you, you can defend them, but <laughs> they are, you can't deal with the 4% R squared or the 5% R squared. That's not discussable. And Professor Baruch Lev, who wrote the book, The End of Accounting, is probably the most published market researcher in the world by far. Okay, Bill Beaver was in the former generation. And uh, what he basically says very conservatively is that you need to extend the measurements to non gap that's, that's what he said. Okay, so what I wanted to do is just talk to you a little bit about this emerging, this emerging set of technologies. I can find the mouse here somewhere. This emerging set of technologies that are affecting some research. Um, and so the, the big effect here that I'm talking about is how data is collected and how is it accumulated. And eventually, we are going to see Abby pick up her audit quality paper and create the exogenous audit quality paper, whereby she's going to, instead of looking uh, data and audit analytics, etc. She's going to try to relate some measure of audit quality into a whole set of exogenous variables that she's going to pick up. Anything from the impact of recent stream of tweets uh, to weather, to macroeconomic data, to cell phone tweets, to go ahead and all kind of things that you that you can measure. Um, and so this here talks basically about, about the measurement of, that your smartphone does of your location. And there are two basically dimensions of it. One of it could be a GPS. And GPS is basically calculate the angle against a state geostationary satellite and tells you basically where you are. And then this technology that we have developed at the labs 
uh, the Jeep technology that based on the triangulation of full powers and the strength of the signal, you can establish where the person is. So there are two technologies, Jeep technology, GPS technology. Jeep is the name they gave it there, and their lives. Okay, now, what does that imply? It implies that most things that have a cell phone around them are geolocation identified. Now we talked last week in the other class about these exo exogenous values goes a little bit and I, I did I went through that whole set of background data, scanner data, what was the other mobility data and then we finish up with Internet of Things data. Now, are you going to think, are you thinking that reporting of the future will have any of that data? What do you think, Jimmy? Uh, I think, I think Jimmy is overwhelmed. The reporting should reflect those kind of, those exogenous data to reflect the reality of So what, Okay, I, I want young brains like Abby's to think about if you were the older lady of the universe and you could determine uh, reporting standards. You notice I didn't say financial reporting standards. Um, what kind of measurements you, you would like to give to your stockholders? You don't, wouldn't like to give it to stockholders. I say you'd require to be given, you'd be required to give it to stockholders. Remember, companies don't like to disclose. Why don't they like to disclose? Because like my students, I told you this, they don't like to be graded. So companies, the, more, the least information they give to the owners, the principals as opposed to the agents, they are happier because they have some manipulation ability. Yes, no, maybe. So Eddie, what would you give to the public if you were uh, Head of the FASB. Ask me because we will be financial. Right? I, uh, I don't know. Don't know? I think it's the first time I hear Abby saying I don't know about something. It's a tough question. But the, I'm thinking that like, now we have a standardized reporting system. If you argue that, then you can compare different companies. And then subscribers that Netflix has, okay, as a measure. Could you compare that with the measurement of uh, United Steel, a very physical asset rich company? Uh, a company that uh, owns a lot of real estate? So how would you deal with that, Julie? I'm expect, expecting these young brains here to come up with an interesting idea. Maybe compare within the industry instead of like over, um, over, over the industry. Okay, so you went back to the concept of industry. Yeah, that's what most measurements of traditional does. You say industry is compared. But then there is a little problem called consolidation. Everyone know what consolidation is. When you get a financial report, I don't know what GE is at this moment, but let's talk about GE uh, 10 years ago. GE was 40% financial, like a bank. And then there was X-ray, uh, all kind of different lines of business. And the result, 
was financial statement of GE that was basically a summation of all of them. I always say consolidation is obfuscation. The moment you mix things together that are very different, it's very difficult to debug them. There is a rule which is segment report. It has been 14, maybe there is a new number around it, which basically says companies are required on a footnote to state their main lines of business. But they are only required to do very little detail. And furthermore, they are allowed to decide what's a line of business. So when I was at at and they said we are in the business of information management and movement. We have one line of business. We have anything from network, physical network that they leave out and etc. to residential business. They internally didn't classify it as information network. Internal, they had residential, they had card, they had commercial, they had all kinds of divisions. But they declared themselves as information and movement, and it all together in only one report, segment group. So Shuam and Keshin, our ex PhD students in accounting, Event clustering, and Andy was talking about supervised versus unsupervised machine learning. And supervised is when you have an outcome, like the company got restated or not, and some evidence. Unsupervised is when you have the data and you don't have an outcome that you can use. So what did Shuan and Keshing did? They got a lot of companies and used this, this thing called clustering to see companies that were similar and created some industry segments that were not the traditional as defined. And you know, most people kind of understand that there are these companies called Pew Place that work on one industry. When they get bigger, they start buying other industries, other things that don't merge very well. Uh, but the problem is that the large companies never fall into any of these categories because they are like a mix, a mash of all kinds of things. And if you start thinking about it, there must be a lot of lobbying in the past to allow consolidation. Or might be the times were so different that at that time didn't really matter. And consolidation really basically adds apples and oranges. You know, you, you pick up this Vox example here of Netflix, and you add the inventory that Netflix holds to some subsidiary of Netflix that sells cement. What does that measurement mean? Absolutely nothing. And that's the problem with with consolidation. And what the FASB and the PCOB do is create these very narrow rules to resolve one particular problem. But they haven't resolved the serious, serious problem that we, that's emerging, that the meaningfulness of this decreased substantially. Organization SASB is actually an important organization they tried to create measurement sustainability. They have gone and classified, I don't know, 60 different industries of how they should be measured for sustainability and other measures. Uh, the guy, Bob Hertz, who talked here about two years ago to all the uh, students and came by last week and got interviewed by Celine and myself, uh, he is one of the founders of SASB. And he's trying to say that companies should be measured in a more sustainable method and classified into areas that are reasonably comparable. Now, this destroys some of you accounting students' view of the world. I'm sorry I don't, I don't mean to make you hate accounting, 
but this is the problem that's going to emerge. Just imagine, tell me what's going to happen when this number of four or five percent becomes one or two percent. You know, I, I have heard in conferences people come and say, let's abolish financial statements. Because they don't inform. Yeah. But doesn't the financial statement use for tax purpose still? Yeah, the IRS would have to come up with their own rules of how to measure things. And they do have it. They, the IRS doesn't follow FASB rules. The IRS have many, many rules about uh, about how to measure certain things. But yes, you know she's a good Korean girl because she immediately thinks about money. <laughs> because that, that's of course that's what the concern is um, of all these measurement things. At the end, countries need money to live. And if you change the accounting rules, you might be decreasing the earnings of the country. And of course, they need to build roads, they need to pay social security, they need to do all kinds of different things. The same kind of thing that we are studying, uh, we have a project dealing with uh, cyber currencies. And this project is Katrina and Philip who are working on with Luca. And uh, in that project, you know, men, they are thinking about Bitcoin and other cyber currencies. And if you start thinking about this, the problem with those things is that the government cannot measure the economic activity in them because they're encrypted and they are in a blockchain. And so what happens? People can, who is using Bitcoin the most? Illegal businesses. Businesses that don't want to pay taxes. And so what happened in China and in Korea? You know what happened in Korea? No Bitcoin allowed. Okay, so in China, same kind of thing. And China is going to be proposing their own e-currency. And what's going to happen there? They're going to have a back door, whereby the government can go and see the economic activity. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, governments need money to live or they can't take care of their citizens. Are you sad? She's looking so sad to hear. Uh, so it's very, it's very interesting what's going to happen. OK, 